You only get one chance to make a first impression. Have you ever noticed some people come up to you with a intensity in their eyes, just electric, and they grip your hand and they say to you, Joe Bloggs, glad to meet you. Other people you meet at a party and there's lots of people and loud music and they say to you, move, 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 move. who are they really? Then there are other people along the spectrum of people who greet you. Some people invade upon introduction, come on strong, and you think, please God, when this ends, I'll never sin again. Others can calm your cares with kindly eyes and a caring smile, and the world is a beautiful world because of them. You only get one chance to make a first impression. And get a load of this. Jesus introduces himself. Allow me to introduce myself. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim release to the captive and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Well, so much for introductions. Let's learn more about introductions. What do you say? Let's walk through these doors and let's worship God. A blessed good morning to you one and all, and welcome to Drexel Hill United Methodist Church this third Sunday after Epiphany. Let's begin our worship now by joining together in the call to worship included in your bulletin. God is our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? God is our shelter and refuge in the days of trouble and our hope and joy on the days of celebration. Beloved of God, enter this worship in thanksgiving, for God is among and within us. Thanks be to God. Let us join now together in our collect for the morning. Let us pray. Loving God, through your Son, you have called us to repent of our sin, to believe the good news, and to celebrate the coming of your kingdom. Grant that we may hear the call to discipleship and gladly proclaim the gospel to a waiting world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we move now to our service of confession, I say to you, we know ourselves to be a broken people, separated from ourselves, others, and the Lord of life. Let us then confess our brokenness together. O great Spirit, whose voice we hear in the wind, and whose breath gives life to all the world, hear us. We come before you as your children. We are small and weak. We need your strength and wisdom. Let us walk in beauty 
and make our eyes ever behold the red and purple sunset. May our hands respect the things you have made, our ears be sharp to hear your voice. Make us wise, so that we may know the things you have taught your people, the lessons you have hidden in every leaf and rock. We seek strength not to be superior to our brothers and sisters, but to live in harmony with ourselves and all of your creation. Help us to be ever ready to come to you, so when life fades as a fading sunset, our spirits may come to you without shame. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us, in one voice, receive our pardon, saying, Thanks be to God. And now, dear sisters and brothers, let us offer one another signs of peace. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Let us join now together in the prayer our Lord taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Then Jesus was filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in the synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day as was his custom. He stood up and read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captive and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were upon him, then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus, in just a few words, does an amazing thing. 
This scene from our scripture this morning, it's compact, it's, it's brief, and its significance may be overlooked because the brevity doesn't suggest its importance. Its position here at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, its emphasis on the Spirit and Scripture, and its depiction of themes that will dominate the rest of the gospel. In a few words, Jesus has framed the story, framed the gospel. Readers of the gospel now understand that all Jesus does in the coming chapters occurs by the power of the Spirit. Jesus teaches and preaches and heals and casts out demons. He moves among the poor, the outcast, the sick, and the blind. His actions fulfill the scriptures, especially the prophets. But even those who awaited the fulfillment of the scriptures took offense at Jesus and eventually put him to death. The scene we have in the scripture passage suggests that the basis of the people's hostility toward Jesus was a difference in the way they interpreted scripture. Huh. So the people of Jesus' hometown read the scriptures as promises of God's exclusive covenant with them, a covenant that involved promises of deliverance from their oppressors. Well, that's fine. That's great. Jesus is announcing deliverance, but it was not a, a national deliverance, but God's promise of liberation for all the poor and oppressed, regardless of their nationality or their gender, or their race. There is the rub in the Gospels. When the radically inclusive Jesus announces this, it becomes clear to those gathered in the synagogue in Nazareth, their commitment to their own community boundaries took precedence over the joy that God had sent a prophet among them. Huh. In the end, because they were not open to the prospect of others sharing in the bounty of God's deliverance, they themselves were unable to receive it. Now, not only is this scene paradigmatic of Jesus' life and ministry, but it is also a reminder that God's grace is never subject to the limitations and boundaries of any nation or church or group or race. Those who would exclude others thereby exclude themselves. Human beings may be instruments of God's grace for others, but we are never free to set the limits of who may receive God's grace. Throughout history, the gospel has always been more radically inclusive than any group or denomination or church. So we continually struggle with the breadth of love and the acceptance that more nearly approximates the breadth of God's love. Do you think that the unlimited grace that Jesus Christ offers so scandalizes us that we are unable to receive people and we are unable to receive God's grace? And Jesus says, allow me to introduce myself. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Amen.
And now as we move to the sending forth, I say to you, to live is to risk and to care. We are ready to live for all humankind. Life is mission. We choose to be set. And now as you have been gathered in from the world to hear the gospel proclaimed, I send you back now into that same world to tell of the living Christ and take this benediction with you. God the creator, God the redeemer, God the sustainer be with you now and remain with you evermore. Amen. <laughs>